One day, two officers from the local sheriff's office got a call about a problem at a farmhouse. When they arrived, they saw a man and a woman, both without clothes, dead in the bedroom. They had been shot. In the living room, they found another man, also dead, with a gun next to him. There's no question about it, one officer told his partner. This looks like a double murder and suicide. The man came home, found his wife in bed with another man, shot them both, and then killed himself. You're right, his partner replied. It's a double murder and suicide. But I bet when the sheriff gets here, he's going to say it could have been even worse. How could it be worse? There are three people in this house, and all of them are dead. It can't be worse than that. You're on. Just then, the old sheriff showed up. He looked at the two dead bodies in the bedroom, then went to the living room and saw the man on the floor with the gun next to him. It's clear, said the sheriff, nodding his head. It was a double murder and suicide. The man got home, found his wife with another man, and shot them both. Then he killed himself. After a pause, the old sheriff looked at his officers, but, you know, he said, it could have been worse. The officer who had made the bed jumped up and yelled, Sheriff, how could it be worse? There are three people in this house, and all three are dead. It can't get any worse. Oh, yes, it could, the sheriff replied. You see that man there on the floor? If he had come home yesterday, I would be the one dead in that bed. In a remote town, a large sinkhole unexpectedly opens up. It proves to be quite dangerous, with a surprising number of townsfolk falling into it and injuring themselves. The town's small hospital quickly becomes overwhelmed with the influx of patients, and the mayor realizes he needs to do something. He calls together the city council to figure out a plan. They're all extremely concerned and eager to find a solution to this unexpected problem. The most intelligent counselor in the town, known for his analytical thinking, suggests they station an ambulance right next to the hole. This would ensure the injured people could be transported to the hospital as quickly as possible. The rest of the council thinks this is a brilliant idea and unanimously agree. However, there's a significant roadblock. The town only has two ambulances, both of which are desperately needed in the center of town to respond to regular emergencies. So the mayor gathers the council again, hoping for another practical solution. The second smartest counselor, known for his creative problem-solving skills, suggests they close the road between the sinkhole and the hospital. This way, the ambulance wouldn't be slowed down by traffic and it could transport people faster. Once again, everyone in the meeting nods their heads in agreement, believing they've found the answer. Unfortunately, this solution only leads to more problems, as the closure of the main road causes more traffic accidents on the smaller, narrower roads. Running out of options and getting increasingly desperate, the council meets for a third time. This time, the third smartest counselor, who is known for thinking outside the box, says they need to tear down the hospital and rebuild it next to the sinkhole. The mayor, who had been patient so far, loses his cool. He slams his fist on the table and yells, You fools! Have you any idea how much it would cost to relocate the hospital? That's an expensive and time-consuming solution. The solution to this problem is obvious and much simpler. We fill in the problematic hole here and then dig a new one right next to the hospital. Three great friends, always up for an adventure, find themselves cruising in a flashy sports car on a sunny afternoon. They're laughing, joking, and soaking up the day, the radio blaring their favorite tunes. The man in the driver's seat, feeling invincible in the sleek vehicle, decides to attempt a daring drift through a busy downtown intersection. Despite his confidence, his driving skills fall short. Inevitably, the car spins out of control and crashes head-on into a large tree. The impact is violent, and tragically, all three friends are killed on the spot. After the sudden shock and confusion, they find themselves in an ethereal place. It's a sort of orientation before entering heaven. The angelic guide, leading the orientation, poses a question to each of them. He asks, When your earthly bodies are lying in a casket, and your loved ones are gathered around mourning, what would you like them to say about you? The first friend, who was a respected doctor in his lifetime, says, I'd love to hear them recall that I was one of the best doctors of my time, who always prioritized his patients. I'd also want them to remember me as a devoted family man. The second friend, who was a passionate school teacher, takes a moment before answering, I would hope to hear them say that I was a loving husband and a dedicated teacher. I'd like them to acknowledge that I made a real difference in shaping the future of our children. Lastly, the third guy, who was always the joker of the group, smirks a bit before saying, You know what I'd like them to say. I'd want them to suddenly gasp, point at the casket, and exclaim, Look, he's moving.
There was a curious young man who had always dreamed of becoming rich. One day he bumped into a well-dressed elderly gentleman who was renowned in town for his vast wealth. Seeing this as a golden opportunity, the young man decided to ask the elderly man about his secret to wealth. Excuse me, sir, the young man started. I couldn't help but notice the fine clothes you're wearing and the air of prosperity you carry. I've heard you were once just like me, starting with nothing. Could you tell me how you built your wealth? The old man, clad in his costly wool vest, looked down at the young man and said, Well, my boy, it all began in 1932, during the darkest days of the Great Depression. I was in dire straits, left with only a nickel to my name. I'd used that last nickel to buy an apple from a nearby market. I spent the entire day meticulously cleaning and polishing the apple until it shone like a ruby. Then, by the end of the day, I sold the apple for double the price, ten cents. The young man listened eagerly as the old man continued his tale. The next morning I took those ten cents and invested them in buying two apples. Just like the previous day, I spent all day polishing them until they sparkled. By evening, I sold them for twenty cents. I continued this system, day in and day out for a whole month. And by the end of that month, I had accumulated a small fortune of nine dollars and eighty cents. Feeling inspired, the young man was about to thank the old man for his advice when the old man went on. After that, I thought of scaling up my business. So I took the $9.80 and invested it in a market stall. This allowed me to polish and display even more apples, and soon I was making around $50 a month. The young man was awed. The story was indeed inspiring, but he wondered how the old man managed to transform $50 a month into such a vast fortune. Sensing his confusion, the old man leaned in and said, and just as I was getting the hang of things and the business was taking off, my wife's father passed away. He left us an inheritance of $2 million. Paul was leisurely strolling through a bustling local street fair, taking in all the vibrant sights and sounds. After a while, he decided to take a break and noticed a table with an intriguing sign that read, Palm Reader, Know Your Future. Intrigued, he thought it might be fun to give it a try, and so he seated himself at the Palm Reader's table. A mysterious old woman with an intriguing aura welcomed him with a friendly smile. She announced, For a small fee of $15, I can decipher the lines on your palm pertaining to love. I can reveal to you your romantic future and love prospects. Intrigued by the unusual proposal, Paul agreed without a second thought. The palm reader gently took his hand and studied his open palm intently. After a moment, she looked up at him and confidently stated, it's quite clear to me that you currently do not have a girlfriend in your life. That's true, Paul confirmed, a little taken aback by her accuracy. With a concerned look, the palm reader continued, I sense a deep sense of loneliness in you. It seems like you've been alone for a while, haven't you? Feeling slightly embarrassed, Paul nodded and admitted, Yes, you're absolutely right. Completely impressed, Paul asked, That's remarkable. You could tell all this just by reading my love line. With a wry smile, the old woman replied, Love line? No, from the calluses and blisters. Hey there, did you enjoy the jokes? If yes, show us some love and leave us a like. Thanks for tuning in and see you next time.